and welcome to the Positively Michael podcast. Today we have got an exciting special event for all of the Michael fans that listen to our show. We're joined not only by Mr. Tom Mesero, which is always an honor for us to participate in discussions with him, but we're also joined by the leaders of several Michael Jackson fan communities all around the web. And it is our hope that by having all of these groups to join us and by having so many wonderfully committed Michael fans listening live on the chat that we'll be able to answer lots of questions that are the most pressing issues that Michael fans are dealing with during this time. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Mr. Tom Mesero, who is on the line. Tom, please um, say hello. <laughs> hello to everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this chat. I'm very, very honored and uh, look forward to uh, giving you whatever help or information I can. Thank you very much for inviting me. And Tom, like I've told you every week, I mean, the fans are so incredibly appreciative for all that you're doing and for, um, you know, all the effort that you've been taking to help all of us to get on the same page during the trial. So, again, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of Michael's fans around the world. Well, thank you. I appreciate it very, very much. It's an honor. So next on the line is a good friend of Positively Michael, and that's Melanie, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and also the group that she represents. Hello, everyone, and hello, Mr. Mesro. I'm so happy to be able to speak with you today. I am with um, MJForJustice.com, which is a website but also encompasses uh, at least four different Facebook pages, um, Michael Jackson Fans of New York, the Arrest Comrade Murray campaign, Originally, Team Michael. We have lots of different interests, but I'm just very pleased and honored to be part of this today, and thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for having me. I hope I can help. I'm sure you can. We have some great questions for you. Yes. Okay. So next on the line, we have Linda, and I'll let her talk about her organization. Hi, I'm Linda Higgins, and I'm with the Michael Jackson Tribute Portrait. And the MJTP is a unique global art project uniting people in more than 180 countries through a portrait of Michael. And one dot equals one fan. And we honor Michael's humanitarian legacy. And we really appreciate you uh, deeply, Tom, for doing this for us. Thank you so very much. Congratulations on, uh, on the work you're doing and the work everyone is doing on this, uh, on this telecast. I just... Uh, I think um, there have been so many, you know, unfair attacks on, uh, on Michael Jackson, you know, in recent years, uh, nasty attacks, uh, very, you know, just concerted efforts to, uh, to take away what, uh, what a wonderful person and a wonderful genius he was, and all of you are doing such wonderful work. I really am proud of everyone, and I'm honored to be here. Fantastic. Well, next we have Richard, and I'll let him talk about his group that he's with. Richard uh, from France, so uh, I am the uh, admin of mjdatabank.com, which is a website dedicated to Michael Jackson. Uh, I started in 2001, so 10 years ago, and this year I, I published a, a book called Michael Jackson King, which is about Michael's artistry uh, from his albums to his short films to his tours, and uh, with several interviews and comments from uh, some of the close collaborators. And um, I, want, I would like to, to thank Mr. Mesro for being here today, and uh, again for everything you've done for my girls and his children and his family. Well, thank you very much and congratulations on all the, the good work you're doing. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next up, we have Krillian. I will pass it over to her. Uh, yes, my name is Krillian. I'm with Positively Michael and I am the um, Investigations Forum moderator. And uh, Pause Mike is a um, it's a web community that's constantly growing and uh, includes uh, our forum, the podcast, the live stream channel, Twitter, a book club, and much more. And uh, it's really an honor to speak with you today, uh, Mr. Mesero. Well, thank you so much. And again, uh, you, you're doing such wonderful work. Uh, you're to be commended, and uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. All right. And finally, we've got Debbie, and I'll let her talk about her group. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Debbie Kunish. Um, from Reflections on the Dance. Um, hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, thank you. Thank you for doing this for us all today, and also thanks to Positively Michael as well for hosting this and, and for the invitation to participate. I really appreciate it. Um, and Tom, the fans also wanted me to pass on their love to you as well, so I wanted to make sure I did that. Um, Reflections on the Dance is a website I created um, to tell the truth about Michael Jackson, about his character, about him as a human being, um, and to debunk all the, the um, 
media rumors and lies that were out there. And it, it, there's a Facebook page, the website, and a blog. Um, there's also a Twitter account and a YouTube account. Well, congratulations, Debbie, on all the wonderful work you've been doing. I think Thank the you. site's wonderful. And, uh, again, everyone is doing their part to, uh, to honor a very, very special, very unique, and very wonderful person, the late Michael Jackson. Absolutely. Well, that's our group for right now. Uh, we're also going to be joined by a journalist, Charles Thompson, uh, later in the show. But we're going to go on and get started. So, Debbie, we'll actually go with you first. Can you please share the question that comes from your fan community with Mr. Mesereau? Sure. Um, I, the biggest thing that's on the fans' minds right now um, that I've been hearing has been getting justice for Michael and his wrongful death. And um, some of the things that I've been hearing, you know, that fans have been asking multiple questions, and they, they center around things such as, you know, uh, does Dr. Conrad Murray have a chance of, of receiving a plea bargain offered to him? And, you know, could this happen? Um, if there's a chance of him serving sentence in house arrest, um, and if he could get less than four years if convicted. So it, most of the questions I've been hearing have been centering around those kinds of concerns. Well, all of these concerns are real possibilities. Okay. You know, the, um, we don't know uh, if there have been any plea bargain discussions. My sense is there will not be a plea bargain because I think any plea bargain would require that he surrender his medical license, and I think he's reluctant to do that. Uh, so I think that pretty much freezes out the possibility of a plea bargain. Now, if he's convicted, could he get less than the maximum four years? He definitely could. Uh, in fact, many of my colleagues uh, think he would get considerably less than that if he's convicted. You never know what the judge will do, but uh, there is a possibility he'll get less than four years for sure. Um, I think Murray's biggest concern is his medical license, and uh, that's the way he earns a living. And uh, clearly, uh, based on evidence in this trial, he's someone who likes to live high. Uh, so I think uh, that precludes any type of plea bargain. Now, the the prosecutors, in my opinion, were very smart in bringing just one simple count. The simple count that they brought is involuntary manslaughter. It's, a non, it's an unintended homicide without malice. And the critical issue is gross negligence. Now, I'm aware of trials uh, in the criminal courts in Los Angeles where charges of second-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter were brought. For example, they've been brought against police officers who shot and killed someone. And they ended up in hung juries because some jurors wanted second degree and some jurors wanted involuntary. I think by bringing this one single count, uh, they've made it much easier to convict him and to bring him to justice. Uh, and I'm hoping that happens. Now, you never know what a jury will do. You never know if one or two jurors will feel sorry for him or blame Michael for what happened. You just don't know who those people are. Uh, but we have to trust the system to do its, its job as, as best it can. And I'm certainly hoping that justice will be done and there'll be a conviction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Tom, someone's asking a follow-up question about, uh, you know, if he is convicted, regardless of the number of years that he has to serve, is it a possibility that he'll be able to make money wh while he's going through, you know, the conviction process, you know, off of jailhouse interviews or books or anything like that? It is possible. You know, there have been... There have been various efforts through the years to try and stop convicted felons from profiting off their crimes. Uh, and uh, these things have been challenged in the courts uh, repeatedly. Uh, certain states have passed laws. There was one law passed in New York years ago called the Son of Sam Law, uh, where a vicious murderer was you know, trying to, to make money off a book and interviews, and uh, basically they, they passed a law saying he couldn't. And most of these laws have been uh, successfully attacked as unconstitutional. The reality is he could make some money if he's convicted. By the way, I think Debbie asked about the possibility of house arrest. That always is a possibility. A certain level of house arrest could be thrown into a sentence. It's a qu the question is what this judge thinks of this person. He may look at him and think he's really a bungler, you know, an incompetent, uh, who was over his head. He may think he was not malicious in, in intent. He may decide that he didn't really want Michael Jackson to, to be harmed or to die. On the other hand, from my point of view, the fact that he wouldn't tell paramedics that his patient, you know, you know was given propofol, that he wouldn't tell police, that he wouldn't tell hospital personnel and, and physicians at the hospital what he had given him uh, as these people tried to save his life, that may just turn the judge uh, around to 
give them a pretty stiff sentence because that's just absolutely horrible behavior on the part of a physician towards a patient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Ugh. Well, that is discouraging. <laughs> You know, it's a system. It's a system that is not perfect. Uh, it's a very, very sound system that has evolved through the years, uh, but it's not perfect. It's populated by human beings. Human beings on a jury. A human being in the judge's spot. Uh, a human being as a prosecutor. Human beings as defense lawyers. And you know, people are not perfect, and the system uh, is designed to do its best. But uh, not everybody gets pleased. Uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, very optimistic that there'll be a conviction and he'll be brought to justice. But as I said before, you just don't know till it's over. Right. Well, Debbie, thank you for that fantastic question. I saw lots of fans in the chat were saying they had the same question, so that was a good one. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, thank you, and thank you, Tom, for answering that. So next up, we've got Melanie's question. Hi, Tom. Thanks again for taking my question. One of the things that I've been hearing a lot from the fans, they're quite concerned about how the jury is sort of taking all of this in. And it seems to some of us that the defense has thrown lots of theories around about what happened in that room. Um, and this week we even learned that the defense dropped this theory that Michael swallowed the propofol himself. Um, to some of us that sounded very ludicrous in the be in, to begin with. But I would like to hear from you what you think the jury thinks about all the sort of flip-flopping about what actually happened and from a defense point of view. Well, well, first of all, I think the prosecution has presented a very, very solid case. And I think they've done it very effectively. They've uh, presented a case chapter by chapter, bit by bit, in a way that I think is very understandable to a jury of non-physicians and non-scientists, okay? I think the prosecutor has uh, proceeded with credibility, with professionalism, and I think uh, he's been very effective in how he has told his story. And I think to end with these three expert witnesses is, is a powerful way to send the message to this jury that what this doctor did was completely unacceptable. Um, so I'm very, very confident about the way the prosecution has handled this. Again, you never know, you know, who on the jury is reacting a certain way. You just don't know. People are complicated. And when people get into a jury room, you never really know what the chemistry among them will be. Um, but my understanding is that we have a very intelligent jury. We have some people with, uh, with you know, good, solid uh, backgrounds that I think will, um, uh, will help everyone ensure that they understand what happened. Now, I'm told from some journalists in the courtroom that this jury is very attentive, that they're taking this very seriously, that they're taking lots of notes. And I was also told the other day that when the defense lawyer was cross-examining the prosecution's experts, that a lot of these jurors had their arms folded and were looking uh, rather skeptical at the defense attorney. So again, this is like reading tea leaves. You never quite know what really is happening. But my sense is that this, this prosecution team has done a very effective job. I didn't think the defense cross-examination was very effective. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I thought the defense cross-examination almost ended up emphasizing some of the prosecutor's main points. Uh, these three experts uh, at the end, uh, again, there's one left to go, but they appear to have been pretty unassailable in their strong conviction that what this doctor did was grossly negligent, was unprofessional, and was way below the uh, required standard of care. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see here from what you're saying for the last three witnesses, there are several people in the chat really saying that they thought that Alon uh, Steinberg, the, uh, the doctor from the uh, California medical license board they just thought he was phenomenal and i know the uh, the media has been calling him teflon alon because they're saying he was so unflappable and flanagan was just going you know round and round and round trying to break him apart and i think that you're right i mean you know by the by the def by the uh, prosecution choosing this order and just sort of putting excellent doctor next to excellent doctor next to excellent doctor, it's really highlighting how truly incompetent Murray is with all of this. No, they've each gone through a list of, uh, of things he did or didn't do. Yes. Uh, all of which individually suggest gross negligence, mm -hmm. all of which in combination prove gross negligence. So I think, uh, I think they've been very effective, and I also think taking Murray's statement at face value 
you, and we know that uh, it's filled with lies. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, assuming that everything he said was honest and correct, they're still showing that there was gross negligence. So I think um, I think the prosecution has done a very effective job. But but you know, a trial's not over until the end. Mm -hmm. Now the defense gets their chance to put on their witnesses to tell their story, to poke holes in the prosecution's theories. So you can't jump to any conclusion yet as to how well the trial's going. But I do think this prosecutor did an excellent job. Absolutely. Well, Melanie, thank you for that fantastic question. So next. Thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to thank Tom as well. Mm -hmm. Once again, for, for being here with us today and also representing so well. I watched a lot of the cable news uh, channels, and you are doing a masterful job, sir, of defending Michael and showing the true side that we all know him to be. So I want to thank you for that publicly. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, next up we have Linda's question. Hi, Tom. Um, you knew Michael well when it came to injustice and legal matters. So if you were watching the trial, how do you think he would be reacting to it? Boy, that's a difficult question because Michael was such a kind, sensitive person. Um, I'm sure he would not like seeing his family go through the suffering and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the horror of watching, you know, uh, all this talk about him and whether or not he was an addict and whether or not he caused this himself. And, uh, you know, seeing that, uh, that very troubling picture of him, you know, uh, uh, having passed away, you know, and uh, uh, I, I think he would be very uncomfortable. I, I don't think he'd want to see his children hear about this or go, go through it. So I don't think um, if Michael uh, is watching this that he's, he's very pleased with the, uh, the level of discomfort, the level of suffering, the level of pain that his family is going through and, and, and also that his fans are going through. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael got great comfort from his fans. Uh, very much appreciated the way fans stood by him during that very, very dark, ugly chapter uh, in Santa Maria, you know, the criminal trial. I can't tell you what it all meant to him to have so many people supporting him when the media was trying to rip him to shreds every day. So I don't think he'd want to see people uncomfortable. I don't think he'd want to see people suffering. I don't think he'd want to see people uh, troubled um, over these, uh, these attacks on him. Even people in the media that uh, are now sensing that they have something to gain by supporting him are still trying to cut him down in certain ways. You know, Nancy Grace, I call her Nancy Disgrace. She, was, <laughs> she referred to him as a junkie the other day. Yeah. I mean, you know, now, you know, if Michael were addicted to prescription drugs, and I don't know if he was or he wasn't because he never took them in front of me, but if he was addicted to a prescription drug or some prescription drugs, it's the doctors that did that because he was relying on them to protect him, to treat him properly. And I've never heard of anyone addicted to prescription drugs uh, referred to as a junkie before. Yeah. Um, so people are still trying to subtly cut him down. I saw Diane Diamond uh, uh, not long ago refer to him as a drug addict. You know, she'll never get over that loss in Santa Maria. And even when these people perceive that it's to their advantage uh, to support the prosecution in this case, uh, and in a sense to defend Michael to some extent, they still want to get their digs in. So it's an ugly process. It's an unpleasant chapter. It's a tragedy. And I don't think you'd want to see all of us upset over it. Yeah, and I think that that was a, a great question, uh, Linda, and I think it's one that, you know, oftentimes it's sort of hard for people to step back and remember that this is such a media frenzy, but there is a man at the center of this. And like you're saying, you know, Thinking about how Michael would respond, thinking about how we are reflecting him, that is definitely an important point of this entire process that all of the fans need to always hold in the forefront of our minds. And, um, Tom, there's a question that's been a follow-up to Linda's question about you, when you were saying that you don't think Michael would want his family to be exposed to these things. Lots of people in the chat are asking about the autopsy photo and why that was released to the public and, you know, especially given the points that you just made about the family, his children having to suffer through that level of, um, you know, being very upset. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why that photo would have been released and why it may have been used by the prosecution? Well, I don't blame the prosecutors for using it if they think they need to use it to win. Okay, they have a job to do, and the job is to find justice and to win. And this is a very rough and tumble system. 
mm-hmm. where you know it's built on conflict. It's a it's a form of warfare, and you've got the defense lawyers trying to dehumanize Michael by making him look like an, a, a hopeless addict who was responsible for what happened to himself. And the prosecutors have to respond to that. They have to humanize him. And they decided that to, to you know, to win this case, they had to show Michael, you know, at his, at his healthiest self, uh, performing, you know, optimistic, uh, getting ready for the biggest comeback in entertainment history. And the next day he lies dead, you know, in a hospital room. I don't blame them for doing that if they felt it was necessary to, to, to emphasize to the jury the tragedy of what happened. I do attack this idea of releasing it to the public. I think um, even though trials are considered public, there have been situations where certain photos were not released. For example, I remember in the um, years ago in the O.J. Simpson case, the photos of the victims were so horrific uh, that they were not released to the public, even though the jury saw them in the courtroom. I think the photo should not have been released to the media, should not have been released to the public, but I don't blame the prosecutors for using it if they think it will help them prevail. Mm-hmm. The chatters are asking who decided to make it public. Was, was it up to the judge? Was it up to the prosecution team? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't want to point a finger at somebody when I really don't know. Um, I sort of wish that... Um, that uh, they had uh, made a motion to seal it. On the other hand, you know, again, sometimes uh, participants in a trial are very concerned that uh, what's in the public domain will affect the jury, that somehow the jury will hear of it or or see it, uh, or somebody will talk to them about it. And maybe someone on the prosecution side thought, we really want these contrasting photos of Michael, you know, performing and getting ready for this comeback, contrasted with him lying dead because of this doctor's horrendous behavior. They may think that if that gets out, it'll somehow help the environment in which they're trying to prevail. But I personally think it should not have been released to the public, but I, but it's, I think the prosecutors, you know, have the option of using it in the courtroom uh, if they thought it would help them win, and I don't blame them for trying to win. They want to emphasize the utter tragedy uh, that came out of what this, you know, incompetent doctor did. Mm-hmm. As I said, you see a vibrant Michael Jackson ready for this big comeback in one picture, and then you see him lying dead, uh, you know, in the next picture. And they want to emphasize to the jury what this doctor did that was wrong, and I can't attack them for that. It's just releasing it to these to the airwaves that I think was a mistake. Yeah, it was it was definitely tough to see, and I know that CNN has actually had to publish a piece on its website defending the rationale behind them choosing to show it because so many people were outraged. And I know that um, on their sister network, Headline News, the picture was shown once, and I think the response was so incredibly negative that they have not shown it again. Sure, sure. But remember what the defense is trying to do. They're trying to dehumanize him, mm-hmm. trying to devalue him. They're, they're constantly trying to emphasize to the jury that this was a hopeless addict who was responsible for his own actions and that their client was just a good Samaritan trying to deal with a very difficult situation. The prosecution has to counteract that. They have to emphasize the tragic loss, you know, the inhumanity of what this doctor did. So it's a rough process. It's, a, it's, it's, it's warfare. And uh, they're trying to win, you know, within the rules. And uh, they certainly, in my opinion, I can understand why they might want to show the jury that. But to put it on television, I don't like that one bit. Yeah, and I, and I also just want to point out, people in the chat are bringing up uh, something that, you know, Tom and I have talked about earlier in the week, the fact that this picture has been tweeted to Paris Jackson. Oh, that's horrible. I mean, it... Absolutely. It is so incredibly disturbing that someone would think that that was an appropriate thing to do. It does not matter what you think about Michael. That is a child. It's just That's inconceivable. That's a cruel, monstrous thing to do. And whoever did that, uh, you know, should uh, go to a mental hospital as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I completely agree. So, ugh, well, thank you for giving us what you think, you know, your take on the picture. And again, Linda, thank you for that great question. Thank you, Tom. So next up is Richard from MJ Databank. Okay. Um, thank you, Jill. So, uh, Tom, in your opinion, and as a lawyer, what is AG's responsibility in Michael's passing um, based on all the elements and testimonies we got so far? Uh, did you-
you say Murray's uh, responsibility? He said AEG's responsibility. Oh, AEG. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really not qualified to answer that question. I know a lot of people think there's a conspiracy uh, of, of, of individuals, including AEG. Uh, and I know these, these theories are out there. And whether there's evidence to support them or not, I don't know. Based on what I know, uh, I think that Murray was completely incompetent, uh, completely over his head, selfish, greedy, narcissistic, full of himself, uh, more interested in his own pocketbook and his own good times than, than the safety uh, of his patient. And there's no doubt in my mind that uh, he should be held accountable. But do I think that other people were encouraging him to, to cause Michael's death? I personally do not. But I don't know all the, all the facts either. Um, uh, I don't, you know, my understanding is that there was an agreement that was being negotiated that was not fully executed. Uh, that'll probably be worked out in a civil court. But I cannot point the finger at someone unless I have actual evidence. And uh, the only one that I really see at this point uh, as being fully responsible for causing the death of this, uh, this musical genius and great humanitarian uh, that we all loved, uh, the only one I see directly responsible at the moment is Conrad Murray. Mm -hmm. It sounds like from that uh, chime that I just heard, I think that that's probably Charles Thompson on the line. Charles, are you there? Yeah, that's me. Thanks. Wonderful. So... Uh, so, Charles, would you like to tell the listening um, group about who you are? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, I'm a freelance journalist based in the UK. I've been covering the Michael Jackson trial and the misreporting of the Michael Jackson trial for about four years now, which began when I interviewed Aphrodite Jones about her book, Michael Jackson Conspiracy. Uh, probably the biggest piece that I wrote about Michael Jackson's trial was on the fifth anniversary of the verdict in his trial at the Huffington Post, it was called one of the most shameful episodes in journalistic history. And I spent 5,000 words comparing the transcript from Michael Jackson's trial to the way in which it was portrayed by the media and drawing the conclusion that the media systematically misrepresented the testimony of Michael Jackson's trial uh, with a specific end to securing a conviction for raising the money. Wonderful. Tom Ezra, that was an excellent article, by the way. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Same here. Thank you. So, Charles, we're going to let you go on and ask your question because we know you have a very limited time. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom, you mentioned Nancy Grace calling Michael Jackson a junkie and Diane Diamond calling Michael a drug addict, but I thought what was uh, the worst comment made so far was by Gloria Allred last week who uh, used Murray's trial as another opportunity to portray Michael Jackson as a child molester. She said in the middle of Murray's trial, but we should all remember that Michael Jackson was accused of child molestation. She said, Michael Jackson had the profile of a child molester. Uh, I'm not saying he was a child molester, but is it normal for a man in his 40s to constantly want to be with children that aren't related to him? Um, and I think it's uh, uh, a trait which we see in a lot of commentators to this day that the verdict in Michael Jackson's trial is completely ignored. Uh, Gloria Allred seems to be completely disinterested by the fact that Michael Jackson was acquitted. Um, and it strikes me that the O.J. Simpson trial aside, there's never really been a court case in which the verdict is so routinely ignored as it is in the Michael Jackson trial. And I know that for me as a journalist who's been covering this for several years now, I find it alarming to watch and the fans find it infuriating to watch. But I wonder how you feel, firstly, as somebody who works so hard Michael Jackson's acquittal to see all that work kind of ignored by the media. And secondly, as a friend of Michael Jackson's, how it feels to constantly see him denigrated. Um, and perhaps what was being the angriest you felt? What's the worst thing that you've seen? And um, do you think that the media will ever really accept the verdict of Michael Jackson's trial? Well, first of all, you have to, um, uh, you know, look at what the media hoped to gain from a conviction. You know, the, the Michael Jackson criminal trial had more accredited media following it and present in northern Santa Barbara County than any trial in the history of the United States. You had uh, approximately 2,200 accredited media from around the world. That's more than O.J. Simpson and Scott Peterson combined. So there's never been a case covered more by the media in America than that one and probably around the world. Now, why were they covering 
covering it so closely. Uh, was it because they wanted justice? Of course not. Justice was the last thing they cared about. What they cared about was revenue and ratings and advertising. And to them, uh, seeing Michael Jackson convicted and immediately handcuffed and, and hauled into jail would have made for a, you know, a shocking you know, story around the world. And to have him sitting in jail for a month or two waiting to be sentenced to approximately 20 years in state prison would have been a tremendous ratings bonanza for them. So they were purely thinking about business, and they convinced themselves that there was no way Michael Jackson could be acquitted. And they convinced the prosecutors there was no way he could be acquitted. And they really thought they were powerful enough to spin the jury uh, any way they wanted. I know during the trial I couldn't you know, watch all the media reports. I was too busy working. But uh, I know that sometimes there would be a scathing, scandalous-sounding direct examination by a prosecution witness. And before I had a chance to get up and cross-examine that witness, the reporters would run out of the room to report what was said. They weren't there when this witness was cut to ribbons and proven to be a bull-faced liar who had made all sorts of conflicting statements, who, had, who wanted money, who had bragged uh, how much they were going to make off Michael Jackson. I mean, there was a cavalcade of witnesses that sounded so horrible on direct examination and then just cratered uh, on cross. So you're dealing with, you know, huge business, uh, with a business interest in seeing this man destroyed. Uh, I was told by a very big person in the um, in the music industry that I had cost the uh, you know the media around the world over a billion dollars by acquitting him. Uh, so that tells you what we were up against. And people like Gloria Allred are still upset that they weren't able to profit much better than they did um, because he was acquitted. You know, I remember after the last not guilty. Remember, there were 14 not guilties, 10 felonies, and four lesser included misdemeanors. Um, I remember after the last not guilty, you know, looking in the back of the courtroom and seeing almost a collective, you know, gasp that, uh, you know, what do we do now? I saw the disappointed looks on some media people's faces because they now had to walk out of the courtroom and quickly find another story because this one was going to end much more quickly than they wanted. Um, Michael was the best-known celebrity in the world, the greatest musical genius on the planet, and because he was so big, uh, seeing him destroyed would have made such a huge story for them, and they feel they were denied that opportunity when the jury acquitted them. So they're still trying to, um, you know, profit off scandal associated with Michael Jackson, even though he was exonerated. Remember, he wasn't just exonerated of the the underlying charges that the Arvizos brought. He was exonerated of all the other accusations because the prosecution was allowed to bring in the Chandler case. They were allowed to bring in the Francia matter. They were allowed to bring in other alleged examples of him supposedly molesting kids. And the jury exonerated him of everything. You know, under California law, they were allowed to bring in, you know, evidence of what they called similar acts. So the 93 case was litigated, uh, other allegations were litigated, and all of them were proved to be bogus, completely, utterly fraudulent and bogus. He was cleared of all of these attacks, and they don't want to admit that they were wrong for years in trying to attack him and, and, and profit off uh, uh, off, uh, off the, the, smear, the smear campaign. So they don't want to admit they're wrong. Um, and uh, that's a problem we have. The Diane Diamonds and the Gloria Allreds uh, were looking at, uh, at, at glory when he was convicted and hauled off to jail, held in isolation. Uh, I don't think he would have even survived it. And they'll never get over it. They're still bitter over it, if you ask me. I just wondered what you feel actually about this, uh, this kind of breaking news that kind of appeared in the last week that uh, the prosecutor, Ron Vernon, has married one of his prosecution witnesses, Louise Polanka, and uh, Gavin and his brother were both at the wedding. I'm not surprised. Uh, my information during the trial was that they all were bonding and working together closely. Um, I did, uh, you know, sit on a panel conducted by the Los Angeles County Bar Association, uh, I guess it was about a year ago, that Zonin uh, was on, and she appeared with him, and he did introduce her as his fiance. So that doesn't surprise me. And it doesn't surprise me that they became very close uh, to the Arvizos. You know, this was a very intense affair. This was a very, very, 
you know, uh, hard charging, um, uh, difficult, uh, intense experience for everybody. And uh, I think they all became invested in a certain result, and they all shared a tremendous disappointment when they didn't get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And a certain bonding process took place. So I personally am not very surprised at all that uh, the Arvizos were at the wedding. I'm not surprised that Ron Zonin married Louise Palanker. When uh, Susan, you and I went to the L.A. County Bar Symposium, um, Ms. Uh, Palanker you know, just looked at me with a stone face. And uh, when Susan, you sat down, she actually uh, moved her chair to get away from Susan. So uh, there's a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of uh, negative feeling about that chapter. Uh, you know, when I first got into that case, Susan and I went to the evidence locker. We met with the prosecutors, Snedden, Zonin, and Auchincloss. And, uh, you know, they were just feeling no pain. They looked like they were on top of the world. They felt they were going to be the best-known prosecutors in the history of the world. They felt they couldn't possibly lose. They felt that everything was in their favor. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, you know, this is hubris, what I call hubris. This mm -hmm. is, these are people who, you know, they're just, they're just blinded by their own desire for glory. And um, I felt I could take advantage of that. And fortunately, God was with us, and, uh, and we, we saved Michael from all the, the horrible uh, results that they wanted to inflict on him. And I'm telling you, it's horrible. To me, it was a death penalty case because I knew what they were going to do to him if he were convicted. He wow. would have sat in isolation. He would have been abused by guards. There would have been no witnesses to watch it. Uh, it would have been a nightmare. And fortunately, uh, God was with us and we avoided it. But uh, am I surprised that these people all bonded and became close friends? Not at all. I, I have one question. What effect do you think uh, the 2005 trial had uh, on Michael because, uh, uh, in my opinion, I consider it, it, it was very, a, a very traumatic experience to him and that he didn't actually totally recover from this experience. You know, I can only speculate. Um, after the, uh, the verdict, I strongly advised Michael and the people around him uh, that he must leave Neverland. That, um, that these prosecutors and these sheriffs uh, were, were totally humiliated by the acquittals, that they would never get over the loss, and that they would be gunning for him uh, as long as he stayed at Neverland. I was concerned that, uh, that you know, a child would wander through the fence or something, and they would fabricate some phony case against him. And I just felt that he could never live in peace in Neverland. And that was very disturbing to him because he loved Neverland. You know, mm -hmm. he designed Neverland. It was a magical, beautiful place uh, where everybody was happy, and that's what he wanted. But I felt that he could never live in peace. Um, and I did find out later on that uh, Mr. Snedden apparently was trying to put together another case against him if he could, but then he just abandoned the idea. Um, I think the fact that he had to abandon Neverland uh, I think the trauma of this five-month trial, or five days a week, you know, Michael Jackson had to sit there and, and, and hear people call him a pedophile and a conspirator and a criminal uh, who, who would falsely imprison a family, who would abduct children, who would take a cancer, a, can a child with cancer and give him alcohol to, to ply him and get him ready for, you know, for horrible, you know, crimes. I mean, it, to, for him to listen to this day in and day out uh, had to have been a just nightmare because he wasn't built for a process like that. He was a sensitive, kind, intuitive genius who dealt with beauty and magic and humanity and children and kindness. He loved to bring all people together from all races, all religions, all countries. To sit there and be accused of these kinds of things, uh, I think, I think damaged him emotionally. Yeah. I don't really think he ever fully recovered from it. I mean, he sort of lived like a rolling stone after the verdict. He moved to Bahrain, then he moved to Ireland, he tried France and England, he went to Las Vegas, he finally moved back to Los Angeles uh, to get ready for his comeback. I don't know if Michael ever really was at peace uh, following yes. that nightmare chapter um, of the trial. Well, and it's a very, very sad story. 
And Tom, I mean, as always, like I said before, you know, we, all of us Michael fans, and I think people who are just standing for justice around the world are grateful for all of your efforts in that 2005 trial. And, um, you know, I, I really do believe that, you know, you, it was because of you that justice was served. So thank you so much. And also, uh, thank you to uh, Richard and to Charles for your questions. And we are going... Yes, and we're going to move on to uh, to Krillian's question now. Yes, uh, Tom, how is it that Dr. Klein's medical records and even specific references to Michael's Demerol use are being raised in the courtroom, but Dr. Klein's testimony will not be heard or cross-examined? You know, that's a very, very interesting question. It, it, it involves some technical legal issues that were litigated before the judge, and quite honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I was not in the courtroom. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Klein apparently, um, you know, opposed a subpoena uh, by the defense that he'd be brought in to testify. Uh, you know, the judge had to make some decisions about what was relevant and what was not relevant, and what would serve to confuse the underlying issue and, and what would uh, uh, be legitimate for the defense to throw out as they try to uh, defend their client. Uh, that's a very interesting question, and I don't know why he's, uh, he's allowing those medical records in uh, without having uh, Dr. Klein uh, forced in to testify. I just don't know the answer to that. You know, as you know, the defense is trying to divert attention as much as they can from propofol as a cause of death. And they're trying to uh, suggest that other doctors contributed to his demise, that, uh, that their, their client was really a good Samaritan trying to rescue Michael Jackson from what all these other doctors had done. And they're going to divert attention any way they can. Um, but you raise a very, very uh, interesting technical issue, and I honestly don't know the answer to it. And judges decide what can come in and what cannot come mm -hmm. in. And judges decide what, uh, what is relevant given the charges and what is not relevant. And they have to allow the defense to, to defend. Um, but nevertheless, uh, he, he made some decisions that, you know, the 2005 trial would not be coming in, that allegations that Michael was a child molester would not be coming in, and that certain other doctors would not have to come in. And I think the judge was, was saying, basically, that um, I'm not going to let this become a whole bunch of trials in one. This is a trial about Dr. Murray only. And he uh, apparently said the records could come in, but uh, Dr. Klein couldn't, and that, I have to assume, was, uh, was the basis for him. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, there's a follow-up question to that in the chat, and um, this has been addressed by a couple of people about... Uh, any reasoning why Dr. White, who is the anesthesia expert for the defense, has been able to actively consult with the defense while other witnesses have been on the stand and while he, why he's been allowed to be in the courtroom while other witnesses have been on the stand? Well, sometimes in trials, uh, the judge is asked to allow uh, the expert for one side to sit in and hear the testimony of the opposing experts. That happens quite often. And I have to assume that the, the defense got permission from the judge uh, to let their expert enter the courtroom and see what the prosecution experts were saying. As I say, that's not atypical. It, it, even though there is, a, there is a witness exclusion order which says that witnesses cannot sit in the courtroom and watch what other witnesses are saying, very often an exception is made with experts. Mm hmm Okay, that helps explain that a bit because I think there were a lot of people that were very concerned about why that would be allowed, but that helps to make sense. Uh, so now we'll move on to Debbie's question. Oh, um, yeah, one of the things I wanted to say, too, is I, I agree, Tom, with what you said about God having been with you and Michael um, and, you know, for that trial because um, uh, I see that all the time when I, when I look at that situation. Um, and also, it was, it was very sad as well that he had to leave Neverland. I think that really did break him. But the um, next question I had was, a, a lot of fans have brought up about, in the preliminary trial, the different phone calls that Dr. Murray made while, while he was not attending to Michael um, were brought out a lot. And now in this trial, it's not being mentioned all that much. Um, there is... There has been um, one point where Flanagan was, was uh, speaking about it. I forget who the witness was. Um, and he was stating how um, 
you know, you well, you Flanagan said, well, you know, even though Dr. Murray said that he was not in the, you know, was not in the room for only two minutes, you know that it was much longer than that, almost implying that his client had lied. Um, what what is your take on that with with that that particular part of the, you know, with the phone calls and that not being as cr critical in this case? Well, uh, I think the phone calls are critical, and I think they've uh, they've uh, put a human face in those phone calls by bringing in his uh, his alleged girlfriends. Um, I think they've uh, definitely shown that this doctor was distracted, and he was distracted for selfish reasons. Uh, he wasn't distracted for good reasons. And um, uh, I think they've effectively handled that issue. Now, Flanagan looked desperate to me on cross-examination when he sort of uh, pursued this, uh, this sort of conflicting type of approach um, because I think what, they're, what the defense is really bothered by is the fact that the prosecution experts are taking Murray's statement at face value and still saying he's guilty. Mm -hmm. That's a real problem. Um, uh, because the jury knows that uh, that he was lying in that statement, or they're going to know, I think, mm -hmm. um, that he couldn't possibly have just been away for two minutes, and uh, and that he wasn't truthful with the paramedics or the police or the hospital personnel. And um, but even taking what he said at face value, they're still showing that he's he committed gross negligence. Mm -hmm. So I think that the the Flanagan was almost showing a level of desperation when he asked those questions. Right. He just yeah, didn't know what to do. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, Tom, there's a follow-up question to Debbie's question, which is, um, you know, we, we really haven't gotten to hear your total take about Murray's statement. I mean, what did you think that, and I know that uh, one of our members, Ortho Diva, asked that question, do you think that it was effective to hear him calm and measured? I know I personally felt like he was so overly calm, especially considering that this was supposed to be a friend of his that had just died, according to him, unexpectedly, you'd think he'd be a bit more frantic or emotional, but do you think that his calm demeanor in the tape and his very smooth transitions, was that effective for the jury, or do you think that that might have implied guilt or cover-up to them? Well, the calm demeanor will help the defense. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sound like a menacing person. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sound like an evil person. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, from a human standpoint, uh, separate and apart from what he says, uh, that will help the defense, in my opinion. There may be someone on the jury who thinks this is not an evil guy, this is not a bad guy, this is a guy who made some mistakes that was over his head. Um, personally, as a criminal defense lawyer, I'm shocked that they let him sit down with the police and give a statement. Because uh, generally speaking, uh, you don't want your client to sit down with the police and give them information right from your mouth and also tie your client down to specific statements. Uh, I think his lawyer, uh, probably thought he could talk them out of, a, out of a charge or talk them out of an investigation. Mm -hmm. And what he ended up doing was talking them into an investigation. This was not a homicide investigation until Murray gave a statement. Wow. And Murray told them uh, he'd given them propofol. He told them he'd been giving them propofol for a long period of time. And he made them start to think carefully about uh, whether what Murray did was, was appropriate or not. Mm -hmm. um, it was, in my opinion, from a strict criminal defense standpoint, a huge error to let him talk to the police. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm glad he did, because I think we're closer to justice because of it. But in answer to your question, does he sound, you know, does, he, does the statement help humanize him uh, as far as his demeanor and his style and his words? Yes, it does. But it also helps convict him. Right. And I mean, I definitely know that's been something that's been uh, reassuring to me is the way that the two doctors that testified um, on Wednesday and Thursday essentially used Murray's own words in that statement to show his guilt. That's sort of what Debbie was alluding to earlier. You know, the fact that um, one of my favorite moments was when, uh, you know, uh, Flanagan was saying, you know, it was after um, after Dr. Steinberg said that Michael could still be here if Murray had acted appropriately and not deviated from the standard of care. 
And Flanagan said, well, how can that be when the paramedics reported that Michael was cold to the touch and his eyes were fixed and dilated and his mouth was open? And Steinberg said, stop right there. Your client, Dr. Murray, said that Michael's body was warm to the touch and he had a pulse. And after all, I'm going off of what your client said. So therefore, your client's statement absolutely gives me the impression that Michael could have been saved. So the irony is that Murray's lies are actually helping to convict him more. And you'd think, you know, after 48 hours of concocting a story that he would have maybe given a little more thought uh, to trying to get this correct. But I agree with you. I think um, in the end, the prosecution has definitely been able to use this statement to their advantage for sure. Well, as I say, the, the there have been some police sources who have told members of the media that this may not have been a case, but for a statement. Wow. So the police clearly... He had given him propofol. They had mm -hmm. no proof, but he had given him propofol for months, for mm -hmm. example. He gave them that information. Yeah. He's the one who told them he was treating him for insomnia with propofol. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that statement uh, uh, probably is the reason why we're in a, in a jury trial at the moment. Mm hmm. And so, you know, as far as the police involvement is, you know, I, I know a couple of people also mentioned that it seemed like I actually think that Ivy Jivey mentioned this, that the police seemed like they were very much in agreement with Murray while he was making the statement. But I'm assuming that's part of their strategy to get him to continue to talk and continue to say what his version of events were instead of him sort of clamming up and saying, I need a lawyer. Well, you know, one of the reasons why you don't watch your client to speak to the police, uh, particularly so quickly, is mm -hmm. you don't know where an investigation is going to go. Mm -hmm. I don't think the police at that point, two days later, uh, knew this was going to be, you know, end up in a, uh, a trial over use of propofol. Right. They were just trying to find out what happened themselves. Mm -hmm. And the questions by the police officer even show he doesn't really know what propofol is. Mm -hmm. So to have your client come in and make specific statements and to put together a specific timeline the way the defense lawyer did, I think was a mistake. But it certainly helped the police uh, point their, their investigation in the right direction. Right. Absolutely. Uh, well, Debbie, thank you for that fantastic question. And I think that um, that was a question that, uh, that was on the, man, uh, the mind of a lot of fans. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we're nearing the end of the hour. Tom, is there any uh, anything you want to take away from this last week of testimony? I know that the prosecution is nearly done. Or uh, anything you'd like to say uh, to the fans in the chat? We've got um, about 330 people listening in now. Well, look, uh, you know, we have a system of justice, and everybody has to do their part. The prosecutors have to fight for their side. The defense lawyers have to fight for their side. Uh, the judge has to be professional. The witnesses have to take their oath seriously. Um, everybody has to do their part. And, of course, the jurors have to take their oath seriously. Um, I can't guarantee what's going to happen. Uh, you never know what a jury will do. But I personally, at this point, have faith in the jury. I think we have experienced jurors. Uh, many of them have been on juries before. We have intelligent jurors who apparently are taking this case very seriously based on every report I've gotten. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the prosecution has done an excellent job, as I said before. But we don't know what the defense is going to come up with. They don't have to reveal their hand uh, early in the game. And um, you just have to take it day by day and, and keep the faith and, uh, and hope that justice is done. You know, nobody thought we had a chance in Santa Maria. Uh, we were in a very conservative community. Uh, a very uh, pro-prosecution community, and look what those 12 jurors did. They set out for a week. They went over everything carefully. They had a lot of very intense discussion, and what came out of it? Justice, 14 not guilty. Somebody who was completely innocent of every single thing they threw at them. So, um, you know, we have, to be, we have to be patient, and we have to have faith, and let the system work itself out. And thank you to everyone for inviting me uh, for this this hour. I'm very honored, very privileged to uh, uh, to give you what I think about uh, these very complex and very serious issues. And thank all of you for all the uh, the love and support uh, you've given, gave us during the Santa Maria trial, and uh, all that you're doing to, to honor a wonderful, kind, decent, brilliant human being, Michael Jackson.
And that's a perfect note to end on, Tom. I wish you could see the number of uh, thank yous and all the love that's being sent your way from all of the many uh, guests that have listened to you over the last hour. I want to thank all of our guests, uh, Melanie and Linda, Richard, uh, Krillian, Debbie, and Charles for joining in on the call today. Also, uh, my co-administrators, Ivy Jivey and Larth. And, um, you know, we all have to stay strong and we all have to stay unified and continue to honor Michael's legacy and fight until the very end. And, you know, when the trial is not over, we'll still be working to preserve Michael's name and his legacy. But um, this is definitely helping all of us to take a step in the right direction. So, again, Mr. Mesereau, thank you so much for joining us today. And please just continue to fight for Michael. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Tom. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Don't keep it, brother. You got to keep it.